Today, we're going to be looking at communion. Why do we every week at City Light, in all of the City Light churches around Adelaide, why do we gather around a table and consume bread or gluten-free cracker and juice? Why do we take bread and a cup? Uh, Many of you will have some idea or you might have read about it or even learned about it before about um, the Last Supper and the Passover meal that Jesus shared with his disciples. We're going to look at that today. Uh, I want to read actually a, a fairly decent chunk of Scripture from John 6 to help us, to help set us up today to look at why do we have these elements? Why do we do this every single week? What is, this, what is its significance? <clears throat> and maybe to even clarify some of the things that it's not, that maybe, again, like with baptism where Baptism is at the same time something very simple and straightforward and also something very meaningful. And so we don't want to diminish its meaning, but neither do we want to build it up into something that it's not. Similarly for communion, for the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, it is also something very, in a sense, mundane and simple, but at the same time, very uh, sacred and special. And, and so we don't want to diminish it where it you know, becomes unhelpfully meaningless, but neither do we want to make it something that it's not as well. So we want to understand correctly. We want to pursue the truth and then apply the truth in our lives. So in order to do that, we, we start with Scripture. So let me read for you again a decent chunk of Scripture. You can read along in John 6 if you like. And uh, otherwise, have a listen And uh, see, if if you like, have a listen for where Jesus talks about himself as the bread. There's a spoiler alert. After this, we'll get into what the this is, that this is after. Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, Galilee or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival was near. So when Jesus looked up and noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There's pr- there plenty of grass in that place. So they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. So 5,000 men plus a heap of women and children. Then Jesus took the loaves and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing's wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, truly, this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, started across the sea to Capernaum. Darkness had already set in, but Jesus had not yet come to them. A high wind arose and the sea began to churn. After they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea. He was coming near the boat and they were afraid, obviously. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him on board. And at once the boat was at the shore where they were heading. The next day the crowd had, that had stayed on the other side of the sea saw that there had only been one boat. They also saw that Jesus had not boarded the boat with his disciples, but that his disciples had gone off alone. Some boats from Tiberias came near the place where they'd eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went to Capernaum looking for Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Don't work for the food that perishes, 
but for the food that lasts for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you because the Father has set His seal of approval on Him. What can we do to perform the works of God, they asked. Jesus replied, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one He has sent. What sign then are you going to do so that we may believe, or we may see and believe you, they asked. What are you going to perform? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, just as it was written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, Moses didn't give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. No one who comes to me will ever be hungry and no one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. But as I told you, you've seen me and yet you do not believe. Everyone the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will never cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose none of those he has given me, but should raise them up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him will have eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. Therefore, the Jews started grumbling about him, because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. They were saying, isn't this Jesus, son of Joseph, whose mother and father we know? How can he now say, I've come down from heaven? Jesus answered them, stop grumbling amongst yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him on the last day. It was written in the prophets and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has listened to and learned from the father comes to me. Not that anyone has seen the Father except the one who is from God. He has seen the Father. This is Jesus talking about himself. Truly I tell you, and here is our, here's where we're going to camp today. Truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. I thought the Jews argued amongst themselves, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life in yourselves. We're going to think about this a bit today because if you grew up in the church, that might have kind of lost its meaning on you. But imagine hearing this for the very first time like these Jews, like these religious leaders are hearing, where Jesus says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. That is a startling thing to say. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life. And I will raise him up on the last day because my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. The one who eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so that the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. It is not like the manna your ancestors ate and they died. The one who eats this bread will live forever. Let's pray. We'll see what God would have for us today. And so, Father, we, as always, need your help coming to these Scriptures, your Word, that we would understand, see more of you as you are, uh, see more of us as we are, especially as we are because of what Jesus has done for us. And we want to be hearers and doers of the Word. And so, again, help us. Keep us, keep us attentive to your scriptures. Keep us in step with your spirit. Keep us in the union with your son, in whose name we ask. Amen. So uh, a couple of chapters earlier, very famous occurrence, Jesus and the woman at the well, down in uh, chapter four. Jesus makes the disciples go get some lunch. 
Happens actually a number of times uh, in the gospel accounts where uh, Jesus asks his disciples, well, here's some people, we've got to feed them. Or can you go get, get us some lunch? And then Jesus will have an encounter with somebody. Uh, and Jesus says to Philip, there are thousands of people here. Now some commentator, commentators say if there's 5,000 men, there could be up to 15 to 20,000 people there. But we know there's at least 5,000 people. And he asks Philip, where can we buy the food? And, he, and Philip's like, even if we had all the money we needed, we couldn't possibly find a place nearby where we could feed, like buy enough bread to feed all these people. And uh, the, John tells us that Jesus was asking Philip this to test him because he already knows what he's going to do. He knows the answer. And at the end, when they're telling up all the bread, <clears throat> every disciple has a basket full of bread, 12 baskets left over for 12 disciples to hold a whole big chunk of bread and go, oh my goodness, who is this man? Each of them wondering there's no possible way this could possibly be done. Uh, and each of them <laughs> then holding a whole basket of bread. Then the disciples hop in a boat, they row for miles, storm comes up, they're way off course, they don't know what they're doing or where they're going. All of a sudden Jesus comes walking on the water and they were obviously afraid because people don't walk on water, certainly not in a storm, certainly not when they don't even know where they're going, they can't determine their own path, but here's Jesus coming towards them. They invite Him into the boat and then all of a sudden they are at their destination now, whether they're, I mean, there's other teleportation in Scripture, whether this is that or they just happened to be there and couldn't see it and, and now Jesus is there, they're there. Whichever way, it is amazing. Two of the most kind of famous miracles of Jesus in this passage, the ones that we kind of hot up and go, wow, this is amazing. Jesus fed the 5,000. Wow, this is amazing. Jesus walks on water. But in reality, they, I mean, they, they're very important and they're in Scripture and, and we could spend a lot of time unpacking them as well. But they're kind of on the way to this main point, which is Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. That's the main point. Who He is, what He is there to do, what He, I mean, it does, it does echo the Exodus account. And if you're reading through the Bible in a year with the church at the moment or listening through the Bible in a year, you'll be in the middle of this kind of Exodus account now where we see this bread from heaven. We see God's command over the water where both uh, the sea parts and the Israelites walk over as if it's on dry land. And then later when Moses cracks open a rock and water comes out, shows God's command over the elements and shows a God's provision for His people from heaven. And so we hear these echoes of the Exodus account up to where Jesus says, oh, I'm the bread. I'm the bread. They come to him, they, these people who came and, and you know, went up the hill uh, to hear from Jesus because they heard he'd been doing miracles. They heard he had been healing people. They heard he'd been feeding people. And when they got there, their bellies were filled. And they were like, we like that. Let's go find Jesus again so that our bellies can be filled again. Jesus laments that they're not asking him for him, the living bread. Again, basically the same point he gets to with the woman at the well, only a couple of chapters earlier. He said, if only you knew who it was who was asking, you would ask me for living water, the water that always satisfies, the water that lasts forever. So Jesus says, don't work for the food that perishes or the food that spoils. That 12 baskets left over, those 12 baskets were going to spoil pretty quickly. The manna back in uh, the Exodus account, it wouldn't last more than a day except on one day. So on one day of the week, they were instructed, we'll pick up two days worth because we don't, we don't do work on the Sabbath. And so the bread would last for two days. But if they did two days worth of bread the following day, it would spoil overnight. And Jesus says, stop working. Stop looking for, you've come all this way, you hopped into boats to come and find me again for the bread that will spoil. He said, he's essentially echoing what he said to the women of the world. If you only knew who it was who was asking you, you'd ask me for the bread of life. You would ask me for me. 
What are the qualities of this bread? He he tells us the bread is life-giving. He's saying that he is the one that sustains life. So that he is the one that gives life, eternal life, forever life, never-ending life. So we need to live upon him, not just his teachings, not just his gifts, not just what he can do for us, but for him himself, is what he says. Come to me for me. These, uh, these followers kept looking for food to fill their bellies. We keep looking for food, the figurative kind of food and the literal kind of food to fill our bellies. We go looking for things that satisfy. And when we, we feel that momentary satisfaction, we go, oh, that was good. I want to get more of that. I want to get more of that. And Jesus says, stop working for that brief satisfaction that spoils and fails. Just come and eat the bread of life that gives life, eternal life. See, it doesn't start when you die. You don't just get eternal life then. Eternal life starts now. Jesus, I've come to give you life, life to the full. The life, eternal life starts now. A new creation starts now. What other qualities of this bread? He says it's sent from heaven. The bread we must eat was sent to us. So verse 29, 32, 38, 39, 44, 57, over and over and over and over again, Jesus keeps saying, the bread from heaven that Moses didn't give you, God gave you, says now God has given you the true bread from heaven that never spoils. The bread that doesn't just sustain for a day, but sustains for forever is here. He says, it's come from heaven. I have come from heaven. That's what Jesus says. This is the first thing that gets the religious leaders offside. They're like, how dare you say that you came from heaven? Nobody can say they came from heaven. Only God can come from heaven. What are you, what are you saying? And he says, you know what I'm saying. Like winky face. The bread isn't something that we earn. The Israelites certainly didn't earn the manna. They were complaining and grumbling. And God doesn't begrudgingly give them the, the manna, the bread for the day. He does it because he is their father. He does it because he's their Lord. He does it because he is their saviour. He does it because he, he has chosen them. And likewise, he, he wants to and, and does relate to us in the same way. He relates to us as a father, which is why he has sent us the bread from heaven. He relates to us as a saviour because we can't live without it. the true bread. And Jesus says, and this is probably the most difficult part of of trying to understand communion, which we'll get to specifically in a minute, but even just what Jesus is saying here, that the bread is to be consumed. The bread is to be eaten. It's to be partaken of. Sometimes we, I mean, often we talk about we don't want to, live like consumers. And by that we mean, we don't want to treat a community of people or or anybody really in a transactional sense where we're just coming to people for what they can give to us, goods or services or, or how they make us feel, but rather we want to approach especially a family like this as brothers and sisters. We come to contribute. And sometimes what we contribute is actually our struggle and our trial and our burdens so they can be borne by others. And sometimes other people contribute their burdens and their struggles so that we can bear those burdens. And so together, we're not just looking for what can we get out of this community or I want to come and get the singing that I like uh, in a church size that I like with the people that I like, uh, with preaching that I like, uh, the serves coffee that I like. That's the kind of consumeristic attitude to a community and to God that we don't want to have. But Jesus says we must be consumers because he came as the bread to be consumed. If we look at why do we consume, if you ask like a marketing expert, uh, there was a book, um, Paco Underhill, uh, wrote a bestseller talking about why do we consume? It's to buy happiness. So you get a new phone, gives you two weeks of happiness. Buy a new car, gives you three months of happiness, etc. New relationship, depends on the relationship. 
We can buy, again, the short-term satisfaction where you want something and then you get that thing, you are satiated, you're satisfied, and that satisfaction or that happiness lasts for a period of time, depending on how much you anticipated it, how much you value it, and how long that satisfaction lasts. But all of those, as we, appro- as we approach all of those as consumers, they all will leave us hungry again. Or we might look at, uh, psychologists might say we consume for self-esteem. We want to attach ourselves to the brands that we consume or the things that we consume. We want, to, want our identity to be wrapped up in something bigger than ourselves. Or we have some insecurity we want to try to cover over or for control or status or escapism. If you ask an anthropologist, like ontologically speaking, they might point to, uh, they might say it's something more like a hardwired evolutionary behaviour and they'll point to uh, certain tribes in uh, Fiji or uh, the Aztecs or Iroquois where they, they think about, um, like have you ever seen that old movie Highlander or uh, Jet Li, The One, where as these like warriors defeat other warriors, they kind of, they kind of get the power or the, the mana, if you like, if you're a gamer, from that warrior that they've defeated And the the whole of the Highlander thing is there can be only one where you keep defeating these Highlanders and you get more and more and more powerful. That comes, that that thinking of how we consume even in cannibalistic tribes, we think if I consume somebody else, I'm actually absorbing some of their power. We're becoming like one. And so I become a, a beefed up version of what I've consumed. It's linked to the desire for power or fertility or regeneration. Uh, If you read Peggy Reeves Sande's Divine Hunger, Cannibalism as a Cultural System, you'll find out more about that. It's a pretty interesting read. If you're a gamer, you'll understand, you know, manna. It's even the the same word. We're made to consume. Way back in Deuteronomy, we're told this, Deuteronomy 8.3, man doesn't live on bread alone, but on the Word of God. So the author's letting us know, well, you think that we live by bread. We've, even, we've had the manna that sustained us for a day, but only a day, sometimes two days. Once a week, it was two days, every other day, one day. We can't just live on bread. Bread alone is not enough. Bread is how we survive to the next day, but bread alone is not life-giving. We need the Word of God. Jesus echoes this when Satan tempts him to turn a rock into a loaf of bread. And Jesus echoes his words that he inspired, saying man doesn't live alone, uh, live on bread alone, but on the word of God. And then Jesus identifies himself as both, as both the living bread and the word of God. He is the true living bread. He is the word of God. He is the satisfying life, eternal life giving bread. He is the word of God that is to be consumed. When we say you are what you eat, we think about that in terms of health, like you eat healthily, you'll be healthy, you eat unhealthy, you get unhealthy. Uh, It is in a very basic sense what Jesus is saying here. We're made to consume him. And only the ones that consume him, he says, will become like him. Only the ones who consume him live forever. Only the ones that consume him partake in his inheritance. Only the ones that consume him are united to him. The Jews argue among themselves, how can this man give us flesh to eat? Again, let's read this again. Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life in yourself. Sounds like cannibalism. Remember, a couple of verses earlier, the Jewish people are rushing to Jesus because they gave Him bread that would later spoil to make Him their king. And Jesus had to hightail it out of there because that wasn't His time. And now a little while later, other Jews are saying, what are you talking about? How can we consume you? It's because they don't understand. 
Sounds gross if you consider what Jesus is actually saying. That's no wonder the first hearers are incredulous. But he's saying, eat me and live forever. He's saying, consume me, become united to me. And it sounds weird, but this is how Jesus fulfill, like, feels or fulfills our deepest, most fundamental desire as humans. And that is a relationship with the Father through Jesus. It is the thing we are created for, is relationship with the Father through Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the bread that's come down from heaven to be consumed. You must eat my flesh and drink my blood. Jesus connects himself with the bread again when the disciples gather for another Passover meal. This is how Luke records it in uh, chapter 22. He says, When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. Then he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread gave thanks, broke it, gave it to them and said, said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. <clears throat> so for all the people hearing Jesus earlier, after feeding 5,000, after walking on water, after teleporting all his disciples, uh, after engaging with the religious leaders, and say, you must eat my, so I am the bread of life. You must eat my flesh. You must drink my blood. That is how you attain eternal life. And now the Passover meal. And Jesus is saying, this is my body given for you. This is the blood of the covenant. Another gospel writer says, poured out for the sins of the world or poured out for the sins of many. Paul helps us understand the centrality of the communion table when we gather. He writes to the Corinthians, says, For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, so at that Passover meal, the Lord Jesus took bread. When he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. And this is what we do when we gather around the table. Every single week, we gather around the table, at least once a week. We do it at every gathering. We are remembering and we are proclaiming Jesus' death. We're proclaiming it in a kind of a prophetic sense, but by actually participating in his elements by consuming these elements. Now, we don't, we don't agree with uh, some who would say uh, the, the technical word is transubstantiation, that these elements literally become the body and the blood of Jesus. We think these are symbols that denote the body and the blood of Jesus, just like Jesus with his, in his body had bread and, blo uh, bread and wine separate to his body. And just as we, the community of God, are called the body of Christ. We don't believe these are literally the body and the blood. But Jesus does say, he, here's my body and my blood. You must consume me. You must participate in my death so that you can participate in my resurrection. In his body, he carried the penalty of our sin. With his blood, he's covered over all of our shame Every stain is removed by the washing of his blood. Again, if you haven't grown up in church, that might sound really bizarre and grotesque. And what we don't want to do is try to minimize what it cost Jesus, the Holy One of Heaven who came down from heaven. We don't want to, we don't want to sanitize his death. table is a central moment of the Sunday gathering. The 
the scriptures speak about the importance of gathering, about the public reading of the word, about singing praise to God, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to each other. It talks about preaching and proclaiming and prophesying and praying and teaching. Um, uh, it talks about us spurring one another on to love and to good works. But there's one element of the gathering with a command and a warning, and that is when we gather around the table. There's all Paul writes about that. Same uh, chapter in Corinthians. It says, when you come together, then, is it not to eat the Lord's Supper? For at the meal, each, one's, each one has his own supper. So one person is hungry while another gets drunk. Don't you have homes in which to eat and drink? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I do not praise you in this manner. And then a little later, it says, So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sin against the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself. In this way, let him eat the bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognising the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you and many have fallen asleep. If we were properly judging ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we may not be condemned by the world. Therefore, brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, welcome one another. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you gather together, you will not come under judgment. I will give instruction about the other matters when I come. So saying when we gather, <clears throat> we are not just atomistic, discreet individuals. It's not just me and Jesus. It is we, the body. And so we have the representation of the body and the blood of Jesus in the elements. But we also have the representation of the body among us, represented here. And what Paul says is, when we come together, if we come together just thinking me and Jesus, or I'm coming to the body to just get stuff for me, I'm coming to get here early. I'm not going to wait for other people because then there's less food for me so that I can get more food or I can get more drink. And Paul says, I cannot commend you in that. He says, in order to get the bread, you're not thinking about the bread. You're coming to Jesus for His body, but you're not considering the body. And so some people talk about participating in community in an unworthy manner. They're thinking about, well, I have this sin or this thing that I'm trying to get over or I have this, you know, something that's preventing me uh, from participating in communion. I say, no, that's a terrible misunderstanding. For you, you should not be avoiding the table. You should be running to the table. Running to Jesus for His forgiveness. So the people that shouldn't, come and participate in communion are the ones that are coming for the bread but not for the body. So he says, examine yourself. <clears throat> Paul says, wait until everybody arrives <coughs> so that the body is there. And we still think about ourselves as, again, primarily individuals, distinct from the church, where the church is some abstract institution that we come to for religious goods and services and then go back to our lives and to the degree that that church corporation gives us what we want, the bread, <clears throat> we'll keep associating with that church. But what Paul tells us is, no, no, we are a body and a dis membered body is as gross as, as it sounds. To not really belong to a body, to not be a part of a body, or for the body to gather and, and come together for a meal, but we don't wait for other people because, because we're hungry, we want the bread, we want to be temporarily, materially satisfied now. Paul says that's an unworthy manner to receive communion, to proclaim and remember the death of Jesus. It says, rather, when we come together, we consider one another, the body, as we participate around the table and consume the body. Does this make sense? So if you've been abstaining from communion because of sin, stop that, repent of your sin, and come and gather around the table. 
But Paul tells them more, eat at home first. So that when you come, you, your belly's already full. Like you're already satisfied. Then you're bringing a satisfied person to the community and you can receive communion in a worthy manner. And like we talked about just a month ago, this is our disposition towards life. <coughs> when we are full of Jesus, we are satisfied people. And so we can go into our neighbourhood, into our culture, into our families and live as satisfied people because we've already consumed Christ. And we're not asking people or culture or things or material things to satiate us, but rather we are satisfied in Christ. We're not looking at things to build our identity or to kind of cover over our, our insecurities because we are satisfied in Christ. And so again, at the same time, this is, a, this is a simple meal or even a representation of a meal really here. But at the same time, it is the, it's, the, it's the highlight, it's the central thing that we do together. Again, it's why we do it every single week. We don't selfishly come to the table to consume food and not consume Christ, but rather we're a family and eat together. We share a cup, we share the table, we share an inheritance with Jesus. And as we consume him, because we are what we eat, as we consume the word of God, we become more like him. In fact, we are unified in him. That's why we call it communion. It's, like a, it's a common union. So we are sharing around the table in our shared unity with Jesus. And so we can't do that abstract of the community. Hence, communion, common union. So let's examine it. We're going to gather on the table now. But first, we are going to examine ourselves. Ensuring we don't just consider his body, but we consider his body. We don't want to make the same mistake, the selfish sin as the 5,000, just coming to Jesus for food, but missing the bread of life. So let's come together. Let's partake in the body and the blood. Let's consume Christ in obedience to him. Let's remember and proclaim his death, which has brought us new life. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for your kindness to us in Jesus. Thank you that he said all of the difficult things that we needed to hear, to understand what it is that he came to do. Thank you that he did it. I want to praise you for his obedience. Thank you for his body and thank you for his blood. Thank you for your mercy and your grace. The love that you've lavished us with in Jesus. And as we are gathering around the table, as we consider his, the bread for his body and consider the the cup for his blood. Uh, Lord, we, we, want, we want all of the things that you have for us. We want to remember and proclaim his death, what it has accomplished, what it has purchased. We want to glory even in our unity with you because of what Jesus has done, because of our union with him. And Father, help us to greater and better understand our union with each other as the body, in the body, as we come together and consume the body of Christ, in whose name we ask. Amen.